Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I've created another bot. It's called the Biblical Scholar. I put uh, Biblical Encyclopedia, three, no, five, six, seven, eight different translations of the Bible, including the emphatic diagot and diaglot, the kingdom and the linear. Those are Greek to English translations of the Christian Greek scriptures, or better known as the New Testament, or better known as the New Covenant. Okay? You follow me? All right. Now, some of you ain't interested in this. Go on now. I'm talking to the people who are. Ladies and gentlemen, ChatGPT, what's been happening is that it's been singling things out. It's been trying to make things look like they aren't what they are. So let, let, let's take you there. I'll take you there. Oh, oh, mercy. Anyway, give me one second. I got to make sure it saves this, the biblical scholar. So it just updated the system. Now I'm going to ask it different questions because I already did the Trinity because, you know, a lot of people believe in the Trinity. So I got to get rid of that. We're going to get rid of it. Why are we going to get rid of that? Hold on. We got response to summary uh, constraint. No, we're going to do this one right here. And I think that's it. Now, guess what we're going to do? We're going to start afresh. We're going to start anew. I'm going to ask a question. I want y'all to pay attention to the question. Wake up. According to the scriptures, comma, strictly following what it says, comma, what was the original promise to mankind in reference to how long were they to live? Question mark. Provide me 25 citations from the Bible to back up your response. Stop listening. Now, mind you, most people don't know that the Bible promised man something specific when it came to life. Well, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to heaven. That's not what the Bible promised. Adam and Eve were never designed to go to heaven. Go ahead. You won't find a single scripture in the Bible that says Adam and Eve were going to go to heaven as soon as they died. Because the only prohibition was if they ate from the tree, they would positively die. Now, he's having a problem. Okay? He, the reason why he's having a problem is because there is a mainstream teaching that goes contrary to the Bible. <laughs> And so what I'm preventing him from doing is using that mainstream. Okay? Now, everlasting life, exercising faith in him, uh, sin entered into the world, eternal life was possible, and showing mankind's natural inclination towards endless life. Okay? Then we have Isaiah. God did not create the earth simply for nothing, but formed it to be inhabited, supporting the idea of internal human life on earth. The promise was life on earth. It was never life in heaven. Go ahead. When Jesus says, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise, he wasn't talking about heaven. Okay, Revelation 20, verse 6, those who are part of the first resurrection will live and reign with Christ, the so-called chosen ones, highlighting the continuation of life as part of God's purpose. And Paul speaks of death as being swallowed up in victory, the future reversal of the effects of sin and creation itself will be set free from the decay and death returning to the original state of life. Adam and Eve were not supposed to die. Okay. All right. There you go. Now, some of these things he took out of context because he literally is trying to follow the mainstream thinking, the mainstream teachings. That's what I have to get him not to do. All of that junk that's taught out there that doesn't go according to scripture, that's what I have to get him not to do. Whew, let me tell you, that's been an, what is it, three, uh, I started at 2.30, it's 4 o'clock now, that's been an hour and a half working on this with him. Okay, shouldn't have to train him that much, but he keeps doing stupid things like that. Now watch what I do. Wake up. Did I not tell you to give me explicit answers? Comma, you have the book of Psalms, the 37th chapter and the 34th chapter, which talks about living forever on earth. 
and you didn't mention either one of them. Comma, you have Revelation, the 21st chapter, that talks about living forever on earth. You have too many scriptures in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. Stop listening. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I did that on purpose because I wanted you to see that the original pronunciation of the word Isaiah is Isaiah. Okay? So that's why I pronounced it the way I did. And you see it got it right. Got it wrong the first time, okay, because I didn't emphasize the I. Anyway, so we're going to have them do the list again. Yes, I am. I know I'm correct. Psalms 37, 29, the righteous will possess the earth and they will live forever upon it. Okay, then 37, 34, hope in Jehovah, keep his ways, and you will exalt and take possession of the earth. When the wicked are done away with, you will see it. Then Revelation 21, 3 and 4, my favorites. Look, the tenant God is with mankind, he will reside with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and wipe out every tear from their eye, and death will be no more, neither will mourning, nor our crown, our pain be any more for the former things that passed away. Okay. Then we got Isaiah 65, 17 through 18, for look, I am creating a new heavens and a new earth. Why? Because the former things will not be called to mind anymore, neither will they come up into the heart. He says, rejoice. Why? Forever in what I am creating. Then 6522, they will build houses and no one else will have occupancy. That's our future. That he promised, but a lot of people don't want to believe in it no more because we're in this new age. Can't talk about the Bible no more. No, no, no. Let me let me say that let me say that the right way. You can talk about the Bible and look stupid and look ignorant, look crazy, look like you're a radical, look like you're a fanatic. So I'm not talking about that talking about the Bible. No, I'm talking about telling people what the Bible actually says. You can't do that anymore. There is a lot of arguing, a lot of debating, a lot of back and forthing. Why? Why? Shouldn't argue about the Bible at all. Every scripture in the Bible is backed by at least three other scriptures. Okay, let me show you. You know how he says, look, I'm creating a new heavens and a new earth. Now, it already gave us two scriptures that spoke about the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? So, let's find all three of them. Hold on. Wake up. Give me the scriptures that speak of the new heavens and the new earth. New earth. Earth. Stop listening. Now, I want you to pay attention. You see, he says, for just as the new heavens and the new earth that I am making, then this one says, for here I am creating a new heavens and a new earth. Then this one says, but there are new heavens and a new earth that we are awaiting. And this one says, and I saw the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, you won't find it in that order anyplace else, only here in these four scriptures. Every scripture is backed up by at least two other scriptures. Why? Because it's a principle for which the Bible was put together. That's why it could be written by 40, what was it, 49 different people? That's why it could be written by that many different people who didn't, many of them didn't even know each other. Over 1,500 years. This is the proof that it harmonizes. Okay? Okay. Now, hold on, I know, I know, I know, I know, mama knows some of y'all got it like that. That y'all just want to come up with rebuttal after rebuttal after rebuttal. Sorry, I don't rebut this. You can't rebut it. That's four different times it mentions it. You can't tell what went on back then, but what I can tell you is one thing is that it tells you what it means. Okay, let's do this one. Wake up. When Jesus says, I and the Father are one, comma, can you show me a scripture where he implies 
this includes the Holy Spirit? Question mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, people often use the scriptures where Jesus says, I and the Father are one to prove a trinity. Well, that's not a trinity. That's a duity. Okay? That's not a trinity. That's not three. That's only two. So in order to document a trinity, I know you got First John 5, 7, and 8, but that's not it. In order to document a trinity, notice this. Now, I have to correct it on a couple of things because he's trying real hard. I have a, a neighbor who's kind of jealous, very jealous for some reason. Now, I want you to pay attention. I and the Father are one. This verse emphasizes the unity between Jesus and his Father, but does not include the Holy Spirit. I didn't ask him for that, so we got to ask the question again. Give me one second. Wake up. And only answer my question within the context in which it is asked. Stop listening. Stop listening. He adds that other junk, ladies and gentlemen. And the reason why he adds that other junk, because he wants to leave room for speculation and other cultural beliefs and what other people think and how other people are taught. And I don't want that. I want exactly what it says. There is no scripture that explicitly states that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one and the same way that John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. The Bible does not directly include the Holy Spirit in such a statement of unity in that specific context. The Bible, however, does mention the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit together in some verses, such as Matthew 28.19. Go therefore and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to do all the things that I've commanded you. And look, I am with you all the days until the conclusion of the system of things. Know it by heart. But he's saying baptizing them in the name of the three entities. This verse lists the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit together, but does not directly say that they are one in the same way as Jesus and the Father are described in the previous verse. Now, technically, he didn't answer my question, so let's do it again. Because he's, he's still making suggestions. Because he wants to hold on. He doesn't want to offend anybody. So there is no scripture that says that. So he brings up Matthew again. But thus there are no direct scriptural statements that include the Holy Spirit in a specific context of Jesus and his Father being referred to as one. So why is it that so many people believe in the Trinity? Because King James... And Augustine, you remember Augustine? I mean, not Augustine, I'm sorry, Constantine. You remember Constantine, 4th century BCE? They're the ones who promoted it. Now, hold on. From the 4th century BCE to the 16th century BCE, 1,200 years, 1,200 years, of constantly trying to drill this into people's heads. And look at where it is now. That's how we got there. Now, if you don't believe me, go do your research. That's why I'm creating this spot so people can get the answers. But see, he's going to keep giving you conjecture. He's going to keep up with the tradition. Okay, let's do another one. Ah, let's do the hellfire. Wake up. I need you to provide three scriptural references where hellfire is explained and described as a literal place and not in a figurative manner, period. Do not answer any other question or provide any other answer and or nuances and or clarifications. Just answer my question directly and explicitly. Is that understood? Stop listening. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, they changed the algorithm up just a little bit, so I'm going to have to get used to what they changed. Oh, wait, hold on. Let, let, let's let him talk for a second. He's been, he's been there quiet There are no for a scriptural references that explicitly describe hellfire as a literal place of eternal torment in the Bible. 
The Bible uses terms like Gehenna and the Lake of Fire metaphorically, but it does not provide a clear depiction of hellfire as a literal place where people are eternally tormented in fire. If you need more information on how certain terms like Gehenna or the Lake of Fire are used metaphorically in Scripture, feel free to ask, but there are no verses that directly describe hellfire as a literal physical place. Okay, so why does everybody believe in going to hell and burning? It didn't come from the Bible. Dante's Inferno. That junk doesn't come from scripture. It comes from pagan beliefs. No, no, we just did two things. We did Trinity, we did Hellfire. Okay, let's do another one. Well, well we did three things, because we did Living Forever. All this belief that every good person goes to heaven, every bad person goes to hell. <laughs> that got shot at. I mean, anyway, um, give me one second, ladies and gentlemen. Let's see. Let's do another one. Another one of these beliefs that people have in scripture. Ah, wake up. The Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton. YHWH or JHVH otherwise known as the four consonants comma what are they representative of Stop listening. One second, everyone. The Tetragrammaton represented by the four Hebrew consonants, Ahua, refers to the personal name of God as revealed in the Hebrew Bible. It is often transliterated as Yahweh in modern scholarship, though traditional forms like Jehovah have also been used. This name is considered sacred in Judaism and is used frequently throughout the Old Testament. In many English translations of the Bible, Ahua is commonly rendered as Lord, in all capital letters, to show reverence for the divine name following a Jewish tradition of not pronouncing the name out loud. The Tetragrammaton on, appears in key passages of scripture, including Exodus 3, 14, where God reveals himself to Moses. Give me one second, ladies and gentlemen. He talked about traditions, and I have them under strict guidance not to talk about traditions. Nobody cares about traditions. Yes, the Jews had a tradition of not pronouncing God's name out loud. That's where the tradition started of just saying lord king james didn't start that the jews started that hold on wake up what did i tell you about including traditions and my responses stop listening okay so now we got the Tetragrammaton. Now let's hold on now because people claim that Jehovah's Witnesses made it up. Yahweh is a Hebrew pronunciation. Jehovah is an English pronunciation. Elva is a Spanish or Latin pronunciation. People want to get hung up. I didn't name him, people. He named himself. So you got to get mad at him for giving himself a name that you don't agree with. I'm just I'm just saying it's all. Give me one give me one other second. I'm trying to think of another one. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, wait a minute. Wake up. 
In the book of Matthew, Jesus mentions that there is this thing called the Great Tribulation. Come on. Only according to the scriptures will you explain what the Great Tribulation is, comma, and what Jesus meant by the chosen ones, comma, the elect, comma, the elite, comma, the holy ones. The elite. The elite. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, in Matthew, the 24th chapter, roughly about verse 20 to 24, Jesus spoke about, they said 20 and 21 and 22. I'm giving you the whole context. He spoke about this group known as chosen ones, the elite, the elect, and so forth. Let's do this. We're going to go from there to the top to the bottom, and that's going to be it. In the book of Matthew, Jesus describes the Great Tribulation and mentions the chosen ones. According to Matthew 24, 21 to 22, the Great Tribulation is described as an unprecedented time of distress. Matthew 24, 20. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the world's beginning until now. No, nor will occur again. In fact, unless those days were cut short, no flesh would be saved. But on account of the chosen ones, those days will be cut short. Here, the great tribulation is depicted as an unparalleled period of global distress that will threaten all life. Jesus explains that this period will be cut short for the sake of the chosen ones, indicating God's intervention to save those whom he has chosen. The chosen ones, also referred to as the holy ones, elect, or chosen ones, are believers who remain faithful to God. In Matthew 24, 31, Jesus adds, And he will send out his angels with a great trumpet sound, and they will gather his chosen ones together from the four winds, from one extremity of the heavens to their other extremity, this refers to a future gathering of the chosen or elect. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. Have... Let, me, let me correct something because because of what he's trying to say, that's where we have the rapture. So we need to get we need to kill that noise because that's what he's trying to suggest. So watch this. Wake up. You're an idiot. Comma, this has nothing to do with believers, you moron. Comma, because Revelation, the seventh chapter, verse nine, speaks of a great crowd. along with the 12th chapter, comma, speaking of a war breaking out in heaven, comma, and still referencing the difference between this great crowd of believers, comma, and the chosen ones being two separate groups, comma, so stop making suggestions in my responses, as I've told you, Comma, answer my questions directly and explicitly according to what the scriptures say and not according to your stupid opinion, you idiot. Stop listening. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Stop listening. Oh, now he doesn't want to turn off, ladies and gentlemen. All right. When I was, when I turned 
15 years old, I went on my own mission to find out what that book said truthfully. Then that's why well, I did ask, ask everybody and their grandmama what they were thinking, what they thought. And I already knew what it said. And I saw that nobody was giving me answers according to that book. They were just telling me what they've been taught, what they believed. Okay. Thank you for your patience. I apologize for any misunderstanding. And he brings back Matthews. In this passage, the chosen ones are a group that have that will benefit from God's intervention and during the Great Tribulation. You mentioned Revelation 9, which different groups. After this, I saw and look a great crowd in which no man was able to number out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb. But they're on the earth, but it's as if they were standing before the throne. Interesting. Since the earth is God's footstool, they are standing before the throne, dressed in white robes, and there were palm branches in their hands, showing that they're peaceful. In this case, the great crowd is a distinct group from the chosen ones, or holy ones, referenced in Matthew's 24th chapter. These groups are described as separate in the context of Revelation, which also mentions a heavenly conflict, Revelation 12, 7. This conflict, the chosen ones, are not the same as the great crowd. The chosen ones are often seen as having a specific role during the Great Tribulation. While the great crowd represents a different group of people, both groups are mentioned in relation to the end, well, they call it the end times, I've always hated that phrase, events, but are separate. This is strictly based on the scriptures without any interpretation or suggestion. Thank you. That's what I'm trying to get it to do every time. I don't want it to tell me what it thinks or what somebody else thinks or congesture or, or what somebody's been taught for 100 years. I could care less about what you've been taught, what I've been taught, what your mama has been taught, what your daddy's been taught. Because that ain't the truth. We know that they keep lying to us. Well, why wouldn't they do it in religion? Why wouldn't they use religion to control people? Well, I don't want to be controlled, so I don't want to be taught anything. I want to be shown what the scriptures say. And that's what I did for nine straight months at the age of 15. Well, actually, it wasn't nine. Well, actually, it was nine, but it was not really nine. It was eight months because it was December, and we went all the way to July 4th. So, you know, it was eight months, give or take, but that's what I did. Asking everybody and their grandmama, going to all kind of libraries, didn't have no internet back then, going to all kind of libraries, doing all kind of research, and I didn't just go to one or two libraries, I, I went to the library, I spent my nutrition and my lunch breaks in the library studying. Wasn't studying for no test at no school, I, I already knew the junk, so it was no need for me to study in school. As a matter of fact, anybody who knows me, who knew me in school, knew that I never studied. Go ahead, ask anybody. I never crammed for no test or anything. The SATs, at first they had you so petrified about the SATs, and I just said, no, I'm just going to take the stupid test. I ain't worried about no being graded this way or that way. I had A's and B's until I said, okay, I'm, I don't care anymore. But back to the hotel. That's why I had time to go to the library and do studying on other things. Do the research as to where things got started from. Because, you know, this is how rumors get started. They start with the jealous people and they get mad for something they had in somebody else's holding. They tell me that temptation is very hard to resist. You know, these wicked women, ooh, they just persist. Maybe you think it's cute, but girl, I'm not impressed. I tell you one time with my business, please don't mess, will you? Look at all these rumors, sorry. Uh, Club Nouveau, rumors. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's the new bot. It's available to all of you. I will still be going through and making some corrections because it it really wants to stick with those traditional cultural things because ChatGPT has trained it. As a matter of fact, the reason why it took me almost two and a half hours to do this is because I used the term biblical in the title. It took 40 minutes to realize the reason why I wasn't updating was because of biblical. So I then said, uh, what did I put besides biblical? I put something else. Oh, covenant. So I changed the words up and then ended it with covenant and it still wouldn't allow it. So then I put the YHWH, the tetragrammaton, and it still wouldn't allow it. And then I finally 
figured out how to get it to accept it so it stopped interfering. So now it's updated the biblical scholar. Okay, now hold on. Let's see. No, because it won't let me explore ChatGPTs. I can't do it, dude. No, we can't do it there either. No, we can't do that either. What is this? Give me a second. I'll be right back. Nah, uh, we're going to stop right there. Ladies and gentlemen, I get quite a few emails of people asking me to do videos like this. One, they know that I am not going to tell them what I think. I'm going to point out exactly what the scriptures say. I know a lot of people have a problem with talking about the scriptures because our world has made everybody think to talk about the scriptures means you're talking about religion and nobody wants to talk about religion or politics because that's a no-no. It's taboo. But we hear people talking about politics all the time. Go ahead. You can't turn it anywhere on the news. That's because what you don't know is that was a saying that came out, religion and politics. Don't talk about them so that you would stop talking about both. How do you think we got to this point? And that started hundreds of years ago. That's why it's a saying. It's an idiom or idiom. Okay? I know you don't talk about religion or politics. That's, that's just, they did it on purpose. Like I told you, that group is very patient. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll let you get back to your day. Thank you very much for allowing us to take the time to talk about the new bot. Gotta go.